just from my own personal observation, there seems to be a bit of a crisis going on with this method of selecting books to read. You know, should you trust your friends? Should you trust your elders? Should you trust the New York Times book review? Or should you trust Book Talk when you're trying to select your next read? To make sure that that read is worth your time. And every once in a while, I get a comment asking me to recommend books. And being the kind of person who's kind of stingy with these book recommendations, my whole philosophy really boils down to this. Everyone is so damn different that you cannot prescribe a uniform reading list for everyone to read. And we just appreciate that we all have radically different temperaments. And again, I'm going to blame for my education for this pitfall. Because after you come out of high school and university, there's this second sense of like, I have to conform to a rubric. And where is that rubric? Where can I find that rubric? On book talk, um, from New York Times book reviews, or from so-and-so, from my grandma or something. So over time, you start to develop this ability to almost double think and mistrust yourself. You're like, hey, I find that book interesting. And you think to yourself, no, my judgment's probably stupid. So this video is for those of you guys who are not yet confident enough to curate your own reading list or to come up with your own TBR list without relying on some external authority. So hey, this is a video that's gonna give you a sort of like a three-step process for you to get comfortable with selecting your own books so you can be a um, little more intellectually and uh, artistically adventurous when you're reading your next book. Step number one is that you really have to embrace confusion. And one of the things that education systems are really good at doing is to mask that confusion by supplying you with a certain answer. You know when you flip to the back of a textbook, there are always answers there. And for example, now I'm going through a French grammar book to prepare for a, for a certain trip that I wrote about on my newsletter. And I'll talk about that newsletter in a second. So as I'm dealing with these complicated subjunctives and freaking partitives and all these crazy grammar rules, there's always a sense or there's always this urge for me to check the answer before I actually fill in the thing. And schools, universities, they have domesticated us into these answer finding machines instead of genuinely curious learners. Well, the process of learning involves a lot of failure, a lot of mistrials and a lot of mistakes. So you can't grow without making a few mistakes and you can't learn without enduring confusion. So my claim here is you're not afraid of selecting your own TBR and you're not afraid of selecting your own selection of books to read, but it is the case that the reason why you don't want to select your own TBR and you tend to rely on these external voices, book talk, uh, book reviews and all that good stuff and you just end up reading whatever whatever everyone else is reading, is actually because you're afraid of selecting the wrong book. You know, in the case that you select the wrong book, you might feel stupid and you don't want to feel stupid. So you want to go back to what you already know. Hence, you're really barricading yourself from some really interesting, potentially interesting experiences that you could gain from just putting yourself out there and be willing to make mistakes. There are going to be a few stupid books on that list. Sometimes you'll waste hours of your time reading a book that you're just not vibing with or it's just objectively a bad book. But view those little windows as learning opportunities. And I have an extended essay on my Substack, which I'll link you to in the description down below, which is kind of like this exploration of how to deal with confusion and how to befriend your confusion. So I think that's the first step if you really want to curate your own reading list. And the second step here, which is a really fun step, is to wander through bookstores. I don't know where you live, but here in Melbourne, there are some really quality bookstores. One of my favorite, favorite ways to waste my time and money is to browse those bookstores when I have some free time. This kind of browsing is not kind of like I have a book in mind that I have to buy. You know, you might as well order it on Amazon if you have that mindset. But this is more like a purposeless sort of like roaming through a bookstore to see what catches your attention. To maybe read the first two pages of 10 books and decide which one you want to read next. This puts you back in touch with that mindset of exploration that schools have probably killed nearly a decade ago. So you can feel like a kid again. You're at a bookstore, you're just like, oh, this is interesting. Oh, that is interesting. And if you find something extremely interesting, well, buy it, read it in the next few days. Because if you find something extremely interesting, no one can ever stop you from finishing that damn book. And a lot of people ask me, how do you find a motivation to read? Well, how can you not read if the book is objectively interesting? But you have to do the work first to open yourself up to those opportunities where you could potentially fall in love with a book and you can set aside a few days to finish off that book. So reading should be pleasurable, but you have to find the right books first. Hence, this purposeless roaming really helps because it really puts you back in touch with that curiosity. And from that place, some books you're gonna love from this roaming exploration, some books you're gonna hate, some books you're gonna feel in indifferent toward. Just trust your intuition and curate your very own reading list. And step number three, which is my personal favorite, is to utilize the bibliography of contemporary nonfiction books to hunt down 
some really good titles. I feel like I'm picking a bone with the high school education system, but there are just so many things that I disagree with, and this is one of them. One of the things that schools have never taught us is to read a book properly, is to actually understand the structure of a book. So when you actually buy a book, you've never ever learned how to use a book properly as a tool for you to learn, or in that case, how to mine all the potential out of it. If you're engaging with a non-fiction piece of work, and this is um, my most recent read, Humanly Possible by Sarah Bakewell, it's a very fascinating book, but what's even more fascinating is these little pages at the back in small print. And this is something called a bibliography or the notes page. Sometimes these are the pages that freak a lot of people out. They're just kind of like, why would I pay attention to these uh, tedious looking references? I would really encourage you to rethink that because if a piece of nonfiction book is well researched, this bibliography is perhaps your shortcut towards hunting down some really, really good titles. Perhaps this is no news to many seasoned readers. No nonfiction book exists in a vacuum. The author, in order to make a convincing argument, has to reference other writers, old and new, or contemporary writers or ancient poets or ancient playwrights. In this book particularly, it covered 700 years of humanist free thinking, inquiry, and hope, which is kind of like a short history of nearly everything for 700 years. So man, there, there was a lot of extensive research. And for me to not lose my mind and to receive somewhat of a pre-curated list of all these books that I should probably read, I can simply flip to the back of this bibliography and hunt down these original titles. And if the author is credible and erudite, you can basically say that this person has better literary taste than you, and to sort of trust that whatever they recommend or whatever they've cited at the back of the book will serve as a pretty good guide for you to hunt down some potentially interesting titles that you want to read. But then again, you don't want to completely rely on these authors. That's not what I'm talking about. But these are very helpful guides. If you don't know where to start, this is a good starting point. But over time, you'll get a pretty good solid sense of what you like and what you don't like what books are right for your temperament and what books are simply not right for you. And this is your way out of reading what everyone else is reading. Bottom line, the whole aim with this video is not to turn you into a snob where you think your taste is the best taste, but it's simply training you to be somewhat of a critical thinker and to select your own books for yourself and to read what you like according to your interests, your temperament, and your personality and to custom tailor your reading experience to your own life because that's what reading is fundamentally for. There's no point memorizing a bunch of facts. You want every book you read to be life affirming, transformative, and something that's gonna make a dent in your life. Nevertheless, that's all I have for today's video. If you want to know what I've been reading or some of the interesting podcasts I've been listening to, uh, I'm right now running a weekly update newsletter on my Substack, and you can check that out in the description down below. In the last entry, I talked about my trip to Paris and what I've been reading recently and a really funny podcast episode that I've been listening to, so you can check that out. Well, link in the description. And this is partly why I wasn't very consistent with my YouTube uploads, it was actually because I was having too much fun writing articles on Substack. So if you want some extra content, some interesting thoughts, and some interesting tidbits, head over to my Substack page and Check it out. Rob Walden here. Hope you're having a great night, great morning, great afternoon, and I will see you in the next one. Take care and goodbye.